Yeah, just give me one more. So we saw this few uh, in C component factorization, but I didn't tell you why it is relevant. We just uh, knew that some type of interventional queries can be answered directly from the C component factorization. So first, let me jog your memory, right? Um, okay, so recap. Yeah. So we basically saw the three rules of group amplitude. They can be much simply understood using the augmented graph notation. Basically, uh, these separation statements in the augmented graph essentially implies conditional independence plus invariant state. That's the essence of group analysis, right? And we basically saw that uh, if you could uh, find a back door set between uh, Y and uh, P, so even like this, and uh, Z basically blocks paths, all such paths, uh, then we basically said that uh, probability of Y given. Uh, uh, do P is essentially given by this marginalization formula. The difference between the usual marginalization and this is that uh, this should be Z given P, but there is no Z given P. It's just a marginalization of Z. That's why the formula is different. Right? So that's why P of Y given to T is not uh, is not the same as P of Y given T. So the third thing was there was the left hand side is something that comes after an intervention, whereas the right hand side is the most important question is that uh, in general, whenever you are given some pre treatment variables, S, X may not satisfy backdoor, X may not be a backdoor, but some Z, which is a subset of X, could be a backdoor. This actually has huge implications for Simpson's paradox. It will be always the same that this off. Better now? Oh. So, the main implication here being if you have lots of features, it does not imply that's the correct thing to do for control. You shouldn't control anything and everything. You should control only for certain type of subjects. Okay. Now, the third thing, which is actually the more interesting part, was that P of B does not factorize. P of B factorizes over what is called C components. We begin from here just with a review. Uh, so that's why I stopped. I derived what exactly the factorization is, and I proved this factorization for any graph. Uh, I also said some fact properties of this factorization. So I'll just review all of that over here. Yes. Do you mind what do you mean by it's not factorized? Uh, what I simply mean is that uh, it doesn't factorize over, so, okay, so it doesn't factorize over the group. Oops. Here some basic things. So, 
So let's pass different. So suppose S one, S two, S K are the C components. QSI, the factor corresponding to SI can be written as you actually marginalize over all latents uh, U. In fact, the latents that basically have children in SI, essentially. Uh, so I just did, I just denoted without the subscript. Uh, then you have product over all variables in SI, in S, P of VI, given P of I, comma. U, right? And this UI could be some any U in, in this US, right? So essentially, this acts like a factor, but it's already marginalized within the C component. There's nothing you can do to piece them, actually. And we also saw that this exact same thing has a different interpretation that this is also nothing but P of B given. So you intervene on everything except S. And then you ask what is the interventional distribution of S given intervention on everything else. It turns out that these two are identical. Okay. Now we'll introduce some notation. So we'll call Q. You are intervening with exactly the values that are consistent. Okay. So you intervene. Okay. Yeah. Intervene with values. That are consistent with you. So QS of S is basically given by you just intervene on everything else and then you get P of your Now uh, we will basically have a different notation. For, uh, for this, okay, this is the interventional interpretation. This is the marginalized observational interpretation. The fact is that these four are the same. Okay, and that's, you don't require any complicated proof. Uh, but the fact that, uh, okay, so, so the most important thing is that P of B basically factorizes as QSI, right? QSI of SI. Uh, and this is over all uh, C components. Okay. And this we proved last time, uh, right, using an iterative argument. That's why I ended. Now, let me just define uh, one useful notation because it will get very complicated from now on. <laughs> uh, so let's define Q square bracket C uh, to be P of V without C. And uh, the international effect also. In this uh, factorization formula, just take this, which is in fact just a product. We're not even looking at no. the ordering among the C components. No, nothing uh, with ordering among the C components. Uh, and but what matters is that uh, it only depends on depends on the parents of the C components in the true graph. Okay. So we also made that change. But I'm not uh, to be with that again. That doesn't refer to the box. Yes. Because everything has to depend only on its parents. Uh, so you, you only have to worry about things that are before, not ever things that are actually after. And the collider, there's no collider, there's no conditioning. So uh, it based, so it is, you cannot affect you in any adverse way. That's good. Uh, now this is just notation. Okay. By this, this QS is also equal to, so. By this notation, we know that QS is also equal to Q the interventional word. So all we just said is we show also equal last time. Okay. So this is all the things that we have said, but so far we don't say anything about 
So let's first come to the first result of interoperability. So what does this C, C component factorization actually give? So Theta. Q root 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 out of the V for the entire set of variables in mind. Uh, the only question is what are you assigning as intervention and what are you actually assigning as the observational, I mean, observational density point yeah. which you evaluate. Uh, so rest of them, you basically intervene yeah. and then you check what happens to see. I am not claiming this is, this is necessarily uh, identifiable. It's just a definition. It's usually an interventional query. But if it is applied to the C component as a whole, it is identified. And what comes from the uh, so the only thing that we have said is that these type of interventional queries where you interview on just literally everything else is identifiable if the set C is a C component. Now we want to make more statements like this, right? So we'll just gradually go into more such statements. But before that, it's good to see what is the utility of the C component factorization. So let's go to the first theorem. It's already a very beautiful theorem. Uh, it's very non trivial. Okay. One more thing I wanted to point out is that uh, this can also be observationally factorized as V belonging to S probability. Do as you have variables in the, uh, in the, okay, so you sort all the variables in the topology. I'll call it V1, V. I'm reordering. Now, what I'm just trying to say is that uh, if you want to actually find out what QS is observational, uh, because I said the Z I said the Z equal to the So it was for this last time. So it was just simply you you basically take VI that is belonging to belong to S. All such VI that belong to S is need not be consecutive. It could be any standard, right? Doesn't matter. Uh, you all you have to do is just do P of VI conditioned on VI minus one. You just condition on all the things that are before that particular variable, and you just take this conditional distribution. Uh, then that essentially sorry. I have to be very careful with the brackets. So the offering is without brackets. In the bracket section was essentially one, two, three, all the way to this is the bracket notations. I just simply means the i at one in the order, but in the sub superscript. So you just find those things that are in the C offering. You just simply condition on everything that came before. The form of bracket. If this was outside the C component, it would be it would be intervening appropriate, whatever it is. Uh, we can basically show that uh, this query is exactly equal to this query, and this can be observationally identified. We proved this also. Right? So in some sense, you can always factorize a graph by, by this way. All I'm trying to do is finding, find out those factors which belong to the C component. I group them together. I'm saying that's equivalent to actually some interventional query. Okay, so that's also another uh, result of uh, C component factorization. So there is so many things happening, but uh, I guess it's a very good structural result. Okay, now we'll just build on that structural result. The statements are all very simple, but the implications are all pretty uh, enormous <laughs> from now on. Okay, so you may not follow the implication, and that's quite fine. The only thing you, have, you want to follow is what are the important things from now on that would start giving more interoperability. I think that's the best way to understand this lecture, but I will go through everything just to have completeness. But if you don't understand something, it's just simply because you just have to park this notation. Just imagine what the ordering means. And imagine that what's the component I'm talking about? What am I saying is identifiable? So those are the only bookkeeping things that you need to follow. But the key things I'll always highlight, like this as like Okay. Now let's go to the first identifiability result. Yes. So when you say C component, this is in the original graph, right? Yes, this is in the original graph. So far, everything is in the original graph. We will come to <laughs> subgraphs. So. 
over and again, you want to disconnect interventional distributions to observe parallel distributions. But these are very specific interventional distributions that are connected to observational distribution. It is not yet clear why this is actually something that would play an important role in general identifiability. We will show that more sufficient conditions under which it is. Then you will start seeing where it plays a very important role. Okay. So the simplest result. Uh, I this also means that uh, if this by itself starts giving me nice, like if the if there are very few bidirectional edges in the original graph, uh -huh. then most of the components are isolated vertices. Correct. And so this again starts telling me that you can for a lot of vertices I can figure, uh, figure out. out. Yes. Yes. So the more the, the fewer the number of C components, the more powerful. This all things. Yes. Right. But one more important thing I want to point out. Uh, I hope I go beyond this stage, but it's better to find out what I'm going towards. Now, a good thing about C component factorization is that I can do exactly the same thing on a subgraph on G. I define everything with respect to the subgraph on G. Right? The bidirected edges, if it goes and hits some other thing, do forget about it. Just remove them. Just take only the nodes that you care about, any subset of nodes, and you have an ordering. Uh, and then you define C components with respect to that. You can actually show that the joint distribution uh, of that whole component, which is uh, itself an interventional query. So you intervene on everything else, and you have something induced on this component. You can show that that further factorizes according to the C components within this sub. So it's like infinitely recursive. So that's a good property about this theory. It's just that it just simply generalizes. Uh, provided I define what P of B is. This is the only thing I need to define a bit more carefully. Uh, but once I define what P of here, it's observational distribution. But if you take a subset, it will be an interventional distribution induced on those variables, conditioned on everything else being introduced. Then if I have a C component factorization with respect to that subgraph, the entire thing can be So now you are getting very richer and richer and richer uh, set of statements. Saying that if I knew, so if I knew observational distribution, what does it say? If I knew observational distribution, I can always get all these interventional distributions. Now, you might want a more general result. So, what you do is at some point, you have an interventional distribution on a, on, 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 on a subset, which basically means you intervene on everything else and you try to understand what happens on this subset. But if this subset has a recursive C component factorization, you exactly have an and everything and, and, and you have an analogous uh, factorization like this. And therefore, if you knew the interventional distribution, if somehow you can identify it, you can identify all these factors also uh, from that particular uh, thing, right? So we will actually break down any ID query recursively like this to see when the C component factorization can be applied. There was there are things where you can't use there are queries that we end no value. Those are the queries where you say I'll fail. It turns out Spitzer's result says that whenever this algorithm fails, you cannot get it right. But I'm not going to talk about the, the completeness. I'll only talk about the sounds. We know that this algorithm is sound at the end. Right? But that's why we are going to. But from now on, it just gets more intentionally complicated. But I'll just try to point out the, the more important core ideas. But the main core idea here is that if you started with an interventional distribution, on a set of variables V, existing among some bigger set of variables, right? And uh, if you have a C component factorization, the exact interpretation goes. And if you can identify this interventional distribution exactly, you can use that to identify all these other interventional distributions. So that's like a more powerful. That is on the augmented. But that's on the, what is augmented? There's no augmentation. It's just. After intervention. Uh, what is, like, I mean, the text bar. On that graph, you apply this. You graph. apply this formula. Yes. Explicitly specify, assume that this distribution is known, and I consider that to be my observational base, and then everything else will be identifiable with respect. Right? So, I mean, that's a very powerful uh, result. Uh, so, C component is like infinitely nestable in some sense. You keep nesting it until you get the query, like, <laughs> that's essentially all this is about.
right? Okay, now um, let's uh, move towards. I mean, I'll prove all of this, whatever I claim now. But before I prove, I need to show you why this fee component factorization actually is useful, right? Okay, let's take the simplest query. I just want to compute the interventional distribution of where I intervene on X on everything. Right? This is, a, this is an international query. So this is just nothing but P of V given to X. Clearly, uh, of course, V also has X, but it has to be consistent with this. So I don't care about X, but I only care about uh, P of V. Right? So I just want to understand what when, when this can be identified. Some sufficient condition. So the first sufficient condition, the first theorem, is the following. If there is no bidirected path, that connects, uh, okay, let's actually use the notation T. Uh, T and its children. Very simple criteria. T is in return. T is, uh, T would be a subset also, but here it's single. I mean, I'm going to only do theory with respect to single terms for now. Subsets is the more general. So, so basically, all you know, all you want to find out is if there is no bidirected path that connects T and its children, right? Then it is identified. Okay, that's all. Very simple statement. Uh, and the identifiability formula is actually given by P of V given to T. Uh, what you need to do is you need to basically marginalize the factor, the C component that depends on T, I mean, where T is formed. And you just marginalize over T prime because it's a joint distribution over variables in T certainly. Other things too. But then you just marginalize over T prime. Okay. All T prime. Just average with respect to all T prime that you get, that T can possibly take. Right. Then you just have P of V, which is observational distribution. You just divide by Q T is equal to T. This is Q T where T is set to the, this T that you are talking about. Right? That's it. This is the formula. So Q of T is just a, it's just what it's, it's a C component. Where the, 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 the T is found. I don't mean a Q of C or any other chart. It's just simply. The C component that T is found. You take the C component factors, just average it through T prime, and you just multiply it by P of V, and then you just divide by Q. What is T prime? T prime is all values that, uh, so T prime is in the domain of T. Just a marginalization, just an integration. So look at all the C components that tau T C belongs to. Uh -huh. You look at all possible values that can take, sum this Q up. You do not have any dependence on T. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you now get like this big sum. Yeah. Uh, normalizing factor, if you will. Yeah. And then you multiply it by this. P of V by Q T. You just remove Q T from P of V. We know that P of V has other factors. So this will be the rest of the C component factors. What I'm claiming here is that uh, so the rest of the C component factors multiplied by what's supposed to be Q T is now marginalized. That's all. Okay, and the proof is actually very simple. Uh, why is that it's actually very simple? So let's first understand what P uh, T of V looks like. This is quantity similar to you know, conditional distribution. So we got, that would be just P V by if this was conditional, like instead of do T if you just only have like P of T given T, uh, and that would be P of T divided by P of T. Instead of dividing by P of T, you are Dividing by this sort of Correct. normalized QT by the yes, treating QT as the probability. Probability. Correct. But uh, the more important point is that why is this possible only if this condition is true? That's the only thing that we need to understand. So this you don't need to go to P. I mean, Q, I mean, so the first result is that P of V, V know, is a product of all the other Qs. Let's just call it QI. Uh, so where so QSI where T does not belong to SI, multiplied by QT. Uh, look at the notation, I'll change the notation. Uh, here I'm just saying there are other C components, I don't care about them. Uh, there's this C component where T happens. Now, just for a moment, just look at what QT is. QT was, Q 
you sum over all the things uh, in this particular C component, right? So say UST, for example, uh, then you actually do product over P of PI given PA of I upon U. And PI essentially belongs to this C component. Now, P is one of them. When you intervene, what happens? That factor is dropped, chopped. Every other factor remains. That factor is actually chopped. Okay. But if P and any of its children do not have any bidirected edges at all, right? Then QT with that, uh, the T chopped off, essentially. So you can just write it as uh, Q without, uh, I mean, without that factor. So I'll just say without the T factor. But just not, I mean, I don't want to confuse more notation. So I still want to put it like this. Uh, this is nothing but, you take this, you just simply marginalize. Why is that? Think of all the factors that come. You never see any bidirected edge to that. Any bidirected edge will not be present in any of those factors. So whether I'm here, the length doesn't matter. So you pull that. The use never change, right? You are only dropping the T factor, which is equivalent to just simply marginalizing that. If you have any conditional property of P of T given anything, if I just sum over T, that factor goes to one. There will be a problem if the U that you have that has some very weird dependence to something else. What I just said is that there's no children, so you can just actually take attention. Also, the parent cannot, T cannot be contained in many of the parents, P A N. That is precisely, uh, that's what I'm saying. So, uh, I mean, there are children, so that, because there is the C component, right? So, there is no bidirected path that connects T and his children. The children are not there in the C component. This is the, this is the source sinkage. It's a sink node, for example. So the sink nodes can always be taken up, right? So the proof is very simple to observe. So maybe I write that. Yeah, sink nodes can always be averaged very liberally. <laughs> you want to intervene on the sink node? Yeah, just So if you look at a C component, this is an observation. Of course, you can write more complicated things to prove this, but uh, if you look at the C component factor, if there is a sync node, you intervene on it, it is equivalent to just simply marginalize. Because it is not apparent to anything else. In that same shape of it, because that's ensured by the fact that there's no bidirected edge that can see in this. So it cannot be the same. Okay. Okay. But that doesn't mean that this identifies. All I said is that if you can marginalize this, you get uh, QT, but you have to isolate QT and marginalize this. Right. Of course, I said that all uh, QT factors are all uh, identifiable. So here itself, the proof is that. But if you want to write down the proof more carefully, so what I'm interested in is P, T of B, I just now argued, is nothing but you marginalize over T prime, Q, T. The other factor will remain whatever it is, essential to one, right? So you want to estimate this. But what you have, you have the full factor. But you can estimate that. That's not very difficult. Because all you need to do is, you know that Q, T is identical. So marginalized versions of QT definitely are acceptable from observation of data. The only thing is you have to figure out how these are. Uh, these are also individually identified. So the simplest identification formula is just substitute P of V divided by each QT. So you just need to estimate QT from the previous formula. Just marginalize once. Just have it as it is. Multiply and divide P of V. That's the that's the formula. Okay. Uh, this is actually pretty non trivial. Uh, just go one more step and I'll show you that it encompasses backdoor, front door, 
or generalization, some many generalizations of black dog, red dog, everything is just captured by this very simple characterization. All you want is that the, the treatment of the children of the treatment, child of the treatment, should not be in the same uh, C counter. And that's the only thing. Yeah. Uh, so let me actually go to uh, the more general version of this. Yeah. By, this by itself is super non trivial. Not, because see, usually in treatment effect estimation potential outcomes, you always obsess over what came before treatment. But look at the condition. The condition doesn't even talk about variables that exist before the treatment. The only thing it cares about is look, figure out what the children of T are in your graph. Just make sure they're not in the same C count. The moment you have that, forget about uh, estimating interventional distribution on one variable. I can just simply estimate the entire interventional distribution. It's a very powerful result. So if there's any conditional independence that you can test that can certify that this cannot happen, that's all you really need. Uh, because once you have the entire interventional distribution, of course, you want the T of Y, uh, T, you just marginalize. You just marginalize over all B without Y without T, and just do P, T of T. This is just a marginalization for it. Like once you get the entire interventional distribution, ignore this much. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, like, uh, you just need to look at the ancestor of Y. And then like the yeah, that's the right word. That's the right word. Correct. That's exactly right. And then it should be only for this term. Like, is it still possible to estimate if that's not true? We come to that. So that is the rest of the theory. It is possible to estimate. Uh, but for this, there might be. You could have like accurate standards. So I just want to make sure uh, clear. For this query, where you want the entire interventional distribution, this is actually if and only. I only prove the if case. The only if you need to construct two causal models such that you know they have the same observational distribution, so you have to do all this complicated, uh, like, you know, you have to invent new Boolean functions and all that. So I'm not going into that, but it is important. This result is also, uh, so this result also is also But if I care about P, Y given T, maybe P, X, T itself is identifiable, and therefore P, Y, T is also identifiable. But the inverse is not true. You don't have to necessarily know this in order to marginalize and get this. You can directly get at that maybe through other things. So the if and only if holds only for this query, not for any subset query. Okay. So for this query, you have an if and only if uh, statement. But I'm not proving the only if. Uh, oh. This also speaks to what you're saying, like the fact that if you have getting a handle on these QTs for the C component is this is a very powerful statistic. Exactly. So as soon as you have these conditions, like this, like T is in some sense, there's not a, you know, no binary trick path. Yeah. It's all good. Yeah. So it's a very powerful statement. Now we are going to a slight generalization, which actually Sarah already pointed out, which is, uh, let's see. This is like for many use cases, it's a very yeah. I mean, it's an expected condition. Like you do not want like common intents to sort of affect both. Correct, but you, you yeah, to T and Y, and usually Y is a descendant of T. Yeah. Uh, so yes, if Y is a child of T, this would be exactly saying there should be no confounding. That is true. Uh, but backdoor, if a backdoor exists, you can show that they cannot be in the same. Uh, but you can still have B in the same C component and stuff like that. So you have to be very careful about what you're actually trying to say. Okay, that's why the next criterion is probably the most general one. Uh, and the criterion is very simple. Uh, the part that connects T and its children, but in the graph G, ancestor of F, okay, then P, P of S, S is identified. Okay. 
proof. Okay, if you have the first of all, if there is a non trivial effect, he has to be an ancestor of this. This is very clear. Otherwise, the answer is zero. There's nothing you can do. So there's nothing you want to because graph is given to you. You just check ancestry. This is not an ancestor, it just says zero. That's it. If T is an ancestor of S, the first uh, intuition is that all that matters is the are the variables that came before S. It should not be the case that the treatment effect goes to some child or a descendant of S and then travels back. That can never happen because there's no conditioning here. There's no collateral bias, nothing at all whatsoever. So all that should matter is the variable that are before uh, S, essentially, right? So we'll prove this claim more formally, but the first claim simply is that PT of S is identifiable, ID in G, if and only if PT of S is ID in G, the ancestor graph. But it's not a very complicated statement. If you've done homework, improve it. But once you once you have this, right, then if you have this condition, uh, and this condition is basically just applied to this particular graph. So now you apply the previous theorem, theorem of no bidirected path. This is my the ancestor graph is you only look at the S and its ancestor in that subset. Yes. There's no model closures. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I know that uh, you might want to think about uh, is there any connection to D separation and so on, uh, but there's really nothing here. Uh, all that says is that, but one, one important thing is whenever you take a subset uh, and you take C components with respect to that subset, right? The C component factorization holds that are not proven, but that is true. I have a node that is not really an ancestor of us, but it's a part of some C component uh, element that is in that system. Uh, but it doesn't, you remove that. And also remove the binary. It doesn't matter. We have S, you have U, and we have something hanging like this. You are asking whether you should take this or not. What this here says you don't have. To. You just literally cut the bidirected edge. It's not in the state of thing, but it's not even there. There's no marginalization operation, nothing of that sort. You just take the rest of the nodes. Look if by there are other if there are bidirected parts, uh, there's no going through them or any of that sort. Uh, right? So you define new uh, induced. So you basically only consider the induced graph on both the bidirected edges and the directed edges. That's all that matters for G and A of S and the theorem of S. Okay. The only thing that I, uh, you need to convince yourself is that the C component factorization, whenever you take an ancestral set, uh, the C component factorization just holds as essential. There is really no complication. Yeah. The components may split, right? Original C components will split. True, may split. But the criterion here is if there is no bidirected path connects T and its children in G, A, and of S. So I'm already in the subgraph. I'm making the condition only with respect to the subgraph. It is true that there may be some other paths uh, to something else in the original graph, but it doesn't matter. Because this is the this is the uh, query you are interested in. Previously, you were interested in interventional distribution to almost everything else. So there you need to consider the whole graph and worry about that C component. But here you only care about S, and we know that only the ancestral uh, nodes of S, all that matters. So you consider only the C component along with it, the whole theory. But I'm just making sure that the C component will split. Yes, it's a different C component. This criterion is not same as T and its children not being connected by directed path in the original graph. It's not the same. Right, it's a very different criterion, but this is all you require to get identified. But in fact, that's a stronger criterion. So that's why I said you don't necessarily need to identify the interventional distribution, then match it. This is saying that if a different condition is true, you can directly get me. Okay, clear. These two PT of S won't be same. Like in the ancestral graph, the PT of S will be the same as the PT of S in the original. Here, the so, 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 different. Yeah, okay. Other thing of identifiability. 
you can always write three different calculus rules and come to the function of s. There are multiple ways to compute the same function, by claiming any uniqueness with respect to the function computation. But for semi modulian models that are consistent with G, the number is the same. It doesn't matter whether you use this to compute or you use this to compute. That's, that, that should be very clear. Okay. Yes. So, so we see in this example, right? This is not a bi direction. If it was. No, it is a bi direction. So, well, there is another. Uh, no, no. There Let's is, call this like A, right? So, if I have a bi directional edge between U and A, A is also an ancestor. No, no, it is not. It is, that's what I'm trying to say. Oh, okay. So the ancestry is defined only with respect to the nature edges. Okay. okay. The ancestor of S only okay. includes okay. Uh, okay. S plus ancestors with respect to the directed edges in G. Okay. So it should not be that bi-directed edge. Yes, 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 yes. The bi-directed edge will be cut. Yeah. But it doesn't matter. Fine. When you say no bidirected path, you mean an entire path, all of whose edges are by Yes. So it, it's not like I started as to follow directed edges in some point and then bidirected. Yeah. That's not that's not that's not an issue. That is not. I mean, okay, if you look at it graph theoretically, so, so I understand why like if you do draw bidirected edge. You can reach from A to S. So A is an input. You can't reach in the directed basket. I mean, it depends. So the semantics of bi directed is. So I mean, what, what, what is the argument here? So A is like, not an ancestor of S to U, right? Because if U is, it, if it A is not an ancestor, yeah, the definition is just this. Yeah. It has, there has to be a directed path from A to S. There is no directed path. Just because something is hidden, you don't have to. Like, uh, you know, transfer ancestry, there's nothing, no operation. So, so the concept is that U is an ancestor, so ideally it has to be included, but it's not really confounding anything, so we don't include it. We don't, anything. yeah, yeah, because it is only confounding non descendants Correct. So nothing will happen. The only thing is your effects might flow somewhere, but it's never going to come back to S, so you don't have to worry about those parts. U is supposed to be there, but we don't really care in the graph. Theory. In the graph. So no, U is there, you're still there, I mean, P of... Uh, yes, given uh, parents of S, U will be there, but this U never confirms anything else in your calculation. You don't have to worry about it. Okay, non trivial fact, but uh, that's what it is. So let me give you a very simple non trivial example front door. So what was front door? P, mediator, Y, and there was a confounder. The original graph, very clearly, uh, P, uh, so I want what? Uh, P of uh, essentially Y uh, given to T. Let's actually try to apply this theorem, right? Uh, in this particular case, uh, T and Y are uh, in the same C component, but here the ancestor of Y is everything. So there's really nothing complicated going on. But what's interesting is that T doesn't have uh, a bidirected path to the child. So T and Y is one C component. M is another But because P and children don't come in the same 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 component, it's the identical. Although there's a consulting between P and literally the, the thing that you're actually interested in. So that's that's one, one example. Same way, uh, you can see why if there was a back door, again the same thing works. You, you just need to argue a little bit that it cannot be the same same component. Uh, because uh, if there was, uh, so if there is in the same C component, if you condition on any one of them, you open the path. But if you don't condition any on any one of them, there is a path connecting T and Y if, even through observed of the behaviors. So if there has to be a back door, there has to be a split somewhere between Y and between T, and there's nothing in between, essentially. So Y is a bad child out. So both front door and back door can be captured with this very simple uh, criteria. There are more criterions that were proposed after front door and back door, sufficient criterions. It's by Gallus and Paul, there was an intermediate paper. They actually listed a lot of sufficient criterions. All of them can be captured. So the question now is it is if and only if, if S was all the variables. 
But rest is a subset. The question is, is it different place? Turns out it's not. That's when we go into the more general ID problem. So this is just not enough. So you can just repeat that. Like when is it not different? If the so this thing, if S was everything else, everything in the graph, then it's different only. If. But if S is a subset, this is a criteria and only the ancestral set of S. So if it's satisfied, this identifier will show. Sure. But is it is it the only way in which it can be identified? That's not. Unfortunately. This is where the hedge and all that comes, but I'm not going to hedge uh, now. I have to tell you why what happens then, essentially. Right? So let's. So when T is singleton, still it is not. Even if T is singleton, but if this is a subset, this is. I mean, see, this is true. All I'm saying is the reverse is not true. But in the previous case, when S was everything else, then it was true. Meaning this theorem can be generalized further. Yes, this theorem can be generalized further. There's something more for it. This is if and only for which condition the previous S is equal to B. S is equal to B. So for that previous one was sufficient. Yes, but this is not. Is but this will cover front door, back door, everything. So this covers front door, back door, and many other things that. Very, very powerful criteria. The previous one also covers front door and flat door. No, because it's on the entire uh, graph. So it has some complications. Some, okay, sorry, okay. Yeah, but, but if you want to capture, I mean, I don't have exact examples in my mind, but if you really want to capture only front door and back door, this is the theorem. This is always when, when front door exists, this is true. When back door exists, this is only exists. Right. So one interesting thing is that if you ever uh, knew the direct children of your treatment in any problem, and you can somehow do some observation tests to find out that you know there is no actually bad by direct identity in this place. That's it. That's all that is needed. I don't care about what came before, which is a completely different flip on the usual potential outcome way of thinking. Where the first thing they start with is oh, what came before treatment. If what came before treatment, at least directly is not. I'm not saying it is not involved in any of this ID forming. When you integrate all of those, you will get all those variables. I'm not saying that it's not relevant. What I'm saying is the condition is only between T and S2. That's a very, very remarkable result. At least I find it remarkable. It's not at all obvious why it should be why should you bother about things that came after treatment? That's not the case. <laughs> right. I mean, it has other implications, interesting implications. Like if you do have, let's say, a bidirected edge to one of your child, then you somehow want to pick an S such that the ancestor graph of S does not contain. Correct. Yeah, so you can sort of. You can sort of. So that you can do. So, yeah, so that's. So, you can some y. And then um, this guy uh, has to have a bidirected edge only to y. So if I look at only the ancestral graph of y, this doesn't come into picture at all. Therefore, only t to y exists. There, t and y does not have children. Therefore, it's identical. This is exactly the advice. So maybe I should draw the graph this way. Uh, okay, so that's a good observation. So if you look at m bytes, you remember M bias? I said you should not condition on anything in this graph. You just do B of Y given D, that should be the truth. I mean, that is to explain that back door is null set here. But a bigger thing, interesting thing is that here you actually have T and Y are in the same C component in the true graph. Okay, so the full interventional distribution is not identical. But if I only care about Y, then I only do the ancestral graph between T and Y. T and T has only one child. So in that so it also gets a very <laughs> remarkable thing. Uh, but uh, you would think that all these things have not yet been utilized uh, in actual applications. Like when would you be able to certify? 
that this can happen under some other condition. We may need to know something else about the graph, but that's okay, right? But if I can just certify this, you actually have very non trivial identifier. Right. So, you're saying you don't want these uh, latent things to come between T treatment, so to speak, T and its T. So, no, but your effect rate right, could be very far out. But this guy is saying T and just the immediate effect. So, as long as you are separated, you are fine. Everything else is good. It's a very interesting state. So, so that's precisely what's happening here, right? Like in some sense, I mean, you can even have one more mediator here. You can have M1 if you want. Uh, but again, there's no. Yeah. Yeah, you can just still list it as a statement as I told here. You have an example where this statement is not true, but still it is a. It is there in Natian's uh, paper. There's a whole section called the example. <laughs> it is not clear. Uh, the reason I'm not going through that is that uh, you have to draw. It means you there's some other form. <laughs> that requires me to go through all sorts of do calculus uh, things. I just wanted to be at the upside to just say you more properties about this. That's why I'm skipping. But section 4.2. Okay, so actually, uh, at least refer to that example so that you guys can go and take a look at it. So there is an example. So on the identity, so I've been on this paper for the last this lecture and the other many anyway. So on the ID of cause and effects. I mean, you can look at the uh, technical report online. That's much easier. Uh, so it's basically technical report 290L, like this is from Pearl's lab. They have a sequence of technical reports. Uh, this is 2003, right? So 56 page paper where all these beautiful things happen, one after, one after the other. And then section 4.2, they show why, let's call this theorem, I mean, I've already been at one here, so I already got it about the other theorem 2. So they show why theorem 2 is not sufficient. So that is to do with uh, the next theorem I'm going to say. Uh, why you will find very shocking. Okay. Um, but is this clear? This is already saying a lot of things. I mean, you can capture the door, you can capture the door, you can capture many other things, you can capture the bias, you can capture a lot of things that you can actually think of. Uh, all that this will not be better. Yes. But that is because of the fact that T actually splits the C comb. That's the reason. That's the reason. You want T alone isolated as a sync node in one. Once you have, then you are basically done with respect to the ancestral graph. But that's not the only thing. That's the key. If, 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 there is a close form for this. This formula in using QC Qs for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, you take the ancestral graph, you look at the C component with respect to the ancestral graph. You can write it as Q of Bly S, and you go to the previous formula I said. You average with respect to the first C component where T is found and then P of V, but P of V here will be just joint distribution over the ancestral set and nothing else, right? And then you divide by that and you're fine. In fact, the proof of this basically goes as the follows. Um, okay, so one direction is very simple. If this is identifiable in G, if you throw up edges and bidirected edges, that's all you're doing here, you should definitely be identifiable. I said do calculus just gets better if you just introduce more independencies. So if it's less of them, you are able to identify. Sure, sure, surely you'll be able to identify. This. Okay, okay, that's one direction. The other direction is a more complicated direction. The other direction is if it was ever identifiable in G A A N of S, it is identifiable from the joint distribution. And now you mark, you basically marginalize and then find out that uh, essentially uh, all the factors. So it's essentially a joint. So it's essentially a function of P A N of S. Then you come to the G graph, look at the full factorization, and look at what happens when you intervene on T and you look at what, what you want. You want to marginalize everything else. It turns out that only these factors will survive. Others are not, don't matter. So you say that if this is identifiable from P and A of S, this should be identifiable. But I'm not showing this claim, it's in the it's in the paper, uh, and it's a very simple thing to And it's very intuitive. It just simply says that. You cannot have something going beyond and then coming back. 
then we have to worry about the ancestor graph. If it ever leaves the ancestor side, the effect is not coming back to S any. So we do have that. Ask one question for the, the use case for this theorem. Yes. How do you test for this confounded the existence of bilateral? So the, my question is like more basic. I have to like I have T and a child, and I just want to test whether there is a bilateral edge. You should not. I mean, yes, I can give you a sufficient condition. I cannot say that it's uh, necessary. You should not be able to de-separate it. By conditioning on any other set in the ancestral set of S. That means this, there is either an edge which is there, there is also some sort of control. But the problem is, T to children you cannot really test because uh, the fact that there is an edge itself means that D separation will not be true, no matter what you condition on. So if you want to test some uh, confounder between these two, you have to maybe do some type of what. Saranen is doing where you have to test some Reichenbach's principle in a more subtler way, and uh, then you have to find out if it can can it admit only the directed arrow or can it also admit some common cause. So it gets some information theoretic, but I guess with some sufficient conditions you might be able to do that. But people have not looked at all. In general, what's the what's the I mean? Can you come up with some interesting conditions under which you can test this directly? I tell you what the child of T or if you want. And uh, then can you actually test whether there's a bidirected path or not? I mean, those questions have not been yet answered as well. Right? This is a very big the theorem actually says that the like, positions this problem is very important. That the existence of a bidirect. I give you the graph. I tell you that if, if, uh, I give you the graph. Think, uh, and in this case, you know the graph fully. You can yeah. just read it up. Yeah, but that's but it. Yeah. You want to test whether there's a yeah. bidirected path from T to what's child. That's a very important process. <coughs> the moment it is there, then it's basically easy. Yeah. But the moment it's not there, you're in this. You are. Oh, but even if it is there, you still are in business. That's the rest of the. <laughs> uh, you could still be in business. I'm not saying you are in business. You could still be in business. Uh, let me actually go to that, right? So that's a generalization of the C component factors. Before that, it's a very cute. This is very nice. Very nice. Yeah. Yeah. Just say there's no uh, hidden latent thing. No hidden latent. Uh, nothing about the distribution itself. Uh, it can be anything. Uh, you any positive distribution. One Gaussian. One Gaussian. You want, you want some exponential distribution? Yeah, you want exponential distribution. You can have anything you want. The only thing that matters is there should be no confounding between D and Z in the marginalized graph, like C, B, and, and that's all you need to test. Right. So it's a very powerful condition. Actually, for a lot of things that people want to do in practice, this, I mean, more or less, will get you what you want, right? The idea algorithm is to say that look, this is still not the complete story. There's something much, much more you can do. That is where we are going. Okay. But I think it's a good point to understand that this is a very core result. And anything else I'm going to do is just going to make the thing more complicated than this. Like, can you get something new and beyond this? Essentially. Okay. okay. There's one more lemma. I I mean, this lemma is very uh, simple. <laughs> uh, if I just state it, uh, it's just the proof is not very complicated, but the implications are enormous. So let's uh, take it. Okay. So, yeah, so this is the lemma. Maybe a time condition to test. If I give you the bidirectional. If you, so if you can, I can just read it off. So, oh, you mean from a graph here? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Very quick. Very quick. I mean, you're just asking if they have the same C component. Or not. Just need uh, connectivity. Yeah, you just need blood first search. Exactly. Okay. In a subgraph. So nothing complicated. Just keep throwing away as much as possible. Just locate it in a subgraph. Okay, but the other the point goes uh, previous thing. Said so if um, if S was a C component with respect to P, so with respect to B, I said if P of B was known, then Q of S will be known. 
right? And that's the essence of the C contract. I mean, there's one implication of the C contract. Case. And I said that, uh, uh, so now the question is, if I have some set of C and the W, and which is a subset of C, and this itself is a subset of some other, I mean, is the whole, uh, I mean, the whole set of variables, C, right? If I somehow told you that I have the interventional distribution for C, which is Q of C, with respect to the origin, which is you interview on everything, and you just figure out what's the job distribution with respect to C given intervention on everything. Suppose I told you I could compute it. I'm not telling you how I compute it. Suppose I'll give you the number. If you give me C, I'll just give you the number. Right? Then the question is can you actually compute Q of W? The analog to this question. The generalization which analog is to that question. Right? Can you do that? When can you? Very interesting and simple answer. If uh, if W is equal to the ancestors of W uh, in DC, because I only care about I've already taken one level down. So okay. giving the intervention distribution with respect to this C. And therefore, this W is another subset of C. And I'm asking what happens if I intervene on more variables in C? Can I actually find out the effect on a subset of C? Or what all subsets can you actually infer from C itself? And that's the question. And it turns out the answer is I mean, one sufficient condition is if W is an ancestor set, it's ancestrally closed in C, then you can always take C without. Um, without the W, that is all the non-ancestors, and you can just simply average Q of C, and you actually get Q of W. Okay, now this is very powerful. This is the moment I have intervention distribution, I can always get another intervention distribution, which is, a, which is on the subset, as long as the subset is ancestral. All ancestral subsets suddenly are discoverable the moment you give Q of C. So the transference is immediate. You don't have to suffer at all. And all that matters is just matter. Is this subgraph or? Yeah. It's very important. GC is the subgraph. Okay. Now, this is very similar to the previous Okay, what do you find, right? So you want in Q of W, you just want to aggregate with respect to everything in U, product uh, over V in W, P of V given back to P from R U. Okay, this is what you find. Because everything else is slashed. Everything is intervened, 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 everything else is slashed. But you don't have this. What you have is this guy with more factors, Q of C. Okay. But I told you W is an ancestral set. That I have told you. Okay. Exactly. So now the, the point is if this is actually an ancestral set, also Q is that. So look at what happens to So this is V. So let's look at Q of C. So this is summation over view. Few other things that V is in W prime, so V is in C is above W, and uh, there's this guy. Right? I have to argue now that if I just do an averaging with respect to all these Vs, they'll all sum to one. Okay? Uh, simply because if I actually average with respect to them in with respect to C, uh, there would be no U basically talking between these two because this is a closed access to set. Okay. That's only that's the reason why we can just simply average. Just write it down. Okay. So what it says there's a bunch of U's and there is W. There's only this. Then there is W. 
you can have windows from here to the viewpoint that's not an issue. You can have a viewpoint. If you have this thing, that is a sync node. I told you that we want to intervene on sync nodes, chop them off. Why just simply have it? That's all. That's the argument. Okay, so the argument is W is acting like a sync node. So with respect to QOC, QOC is like the observational distribution. So I'm, I'm already cut off all the other previous parents and all that. I'm only focusing on C. Within that, there is some C component this is going on. And I'm just saying that there is no arrow. So there is a W path such that it can be descendant of W, but it can never be an ancestor of W. Of w and it, it can only have arrows to any bidirectional edges. But here, W prime is the same thing. Like the set of nodes is the same thing. So, if I want to intervene on this, I can just literally average on all of that. I'm not even So meta sync nodes get averaged out if you want to interview. So the meta sync node. So averaging out is equivalent to interview. It's a beautiful thing, right? Like <laughs> if you want to intervene, you just, just marginalize all of this. Right? And uh, this is what you get. Is that clear? Okay. Now, once you're armed with this theorem, you get to a more powerful C component optimization, and I'll talk about that now, right? Uh, the ID algorithm follows from whatever I'm going to say the next year on, but uh, how it follows is a more complicated affair. I'll just quickly go through it. If you don't understand, it's fine. You just need to understand the next year. <laughs> That's the only important thing that you can. But you, but you understand, right? So if you take any subset of B, and within that, if you find an ancestral set with respect to C, C can transfer to W. That's all. So if you know interventional distribution of C, you also know interventional distribution of every ancestral set of C. Unless W is some very weird set where it's not an ancestor, then you need to do more analysis. And we will to Okay. So I'm going H, which is a subset of B. Okay. Now H. Partitions into H1, uh, H, uh, K, and G, H. Key components. Q of H, which is the interventional distribution of H, everything else is conditioned. This is actually equal to the product of Q of H. This is just a C component here. There's nothing to prove over here. Okay. Uh, this is always you can just check that. It's not very difficult to check. So this is the recursive property of C components, essentially. But remember, this is already an interventional distribution, it's not observational distribution. Now, whatever was intervened here is always intervened because all H's are a subset of H. So if, if all the interventions carry through, plus more interventions happen in every everything. So there's more interventions if we go right hand side. That's all I'm trying to say. But all of them can be estimated from this. So you go more interventional, but you always can estimate them with uh, lesser. There's already a do do happening here. Uh, that's a, a second. <laughs> yeah. So that's the next year. Uh, so. Now what you do is uh, you order all the variables in H, like V H1 to V uh, H N in G H. Now you want this component. So analogously, Q of H J. A bit complicated. Uh, and uh, okay, so let's define H of I to be those in the ordered set. So those from this ordered set. In HI. So you take all the nodes in 
just induction. So you assume that it holds for n variables in H. Now you assume you have n plus one variables in H. So what happens is you have H1, HK, and there's this new guy, H prime. Right? Now C component factorization. Can I not just think of uh, U of H as P of uh, P of H and two over like we I can do that, right? Two of everything outside it. In the original. That is this that is this distribution of that. So and then can I just not think of Q of H I as P of H I and do over all the things in like outside H. Correct. Why how do you know that it is estimable from this? Because it has additional interventions, right? But that is the, the yeah, that is lemma three. Yeah, yeah, this is important. But then I can just claim that now these uh, like it's a I forget the original graph and now I have a new graph and a new distribution. That is correct, correct, correct. And then this is just this is just the previous. Yes, correct. I mean, if you are convinced with that, I won't go through the same proof. Uh, it, it is it is it is convincing. Okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> because I can then go and finish the idea. So essentially, if okay, so the the observation was that in the previous proof, in the previous proof, replace b by h, right, and s one etc by hs, and you will get everything in terms of q of hi, but this is estimable from lemma. Just the same pattern, but uh, remember, I mean, this is uh, very sophisticated. What is happening over here? I am saying that I have intervened on b minus h. Here, I have intervened on b minus h i larger. Some other said b minus h j larger. Everything. I am saying every one of those is estimable from just q of h. The moment you have a c component factorization, right? So here, there are only two properties we have used. If you have a subset, all ancestral sets are transferable. If you have a subset, all C components are transferable. So whenever I'm in any formula, I just need to keep working through if uh, until I hit one of those two conditions. If I don't hit any one of those conditions, I'll just say failure. It turns out you will fail. <laughs> in the sense that there is uh, there is also an if and only reaction. That's very difficult to prove. So I'm not going to prove here. Then you have to go into what characterizes the structure and so on. But that's all there is to it. What is a final if and only condition? I have to give you the algorithm. The algorithm is. Like yes, that algorithm is. Unfortunately, that's a bit complicated. So let me go to that. But now that you will be able to understand what's happening over here. Okay. So, okay, all we have said so far is that. I think can do that. I mean, I use the word transfer, but what I mean is when can you ID something that's that's intervened more by something that's intervened less. So P of S can be estimated by can is basically ID by P of from S prime by a superset of it. Can this actually happen? Say P of so so P of Q of S. You interview on everything else. Huh? And you try to find out what what is the uh, basically. Uh, so that's what you want to actually find out. But what, I, what I'm trying to find out is is there a superset where you can answer the same question? Then can I do this one? Suppose there's a superset where you know the answer of the data. Suppose you know. Suppose you know this. When will it answer the question? So there are two conditions. One is C component. You do a C component activation on S. It yields S the number. Then you are good to go. S is an ancestral set in GS. 
Thanks for good to go to. And you are fine. That's all you have established. Right? Now I have to take a query and keep working through in some way. I'll tell you how to work through. So that you hit any one of these two conditions. And if you hit, you just say, oh, those factors are possible, those factors are done, those factors are done, those factors are done. And you will be left with some factors. If you're not used with any factors, which I if you're still left with some factors that don't satisfy any one of those conditions, you will see what it is. Uh, then you say, yeah, okay, I think. Right. Yes. And is prime is a C component. I said two conditions. Uh, S prime itself should be a C component. I have not said that here. All I've said is suppose you can estimate P of S prime. We didn't say that how you estimated P of S prime is not my thing. Suppose you got P of S prime somehow. Maybe it's a C component, that's why you got it. That's, my, that's an immediate one layer. But it could have been obtained through several chains also. Because it could have been obtained after this step. And that could have been your new S. And maybe you are trying to recursively estimate something else. You have no idea. But suppose you can estimate the right hand side, then if you want to reduce, uh, sorry, if you want to increase more intermediations, you can do that if the set on which on the subset you are considering is already a C component, or it's an ancestral set. That's all it says. And the formula is complicated, but that's not the main point. These two are the only main points. Very simple two, two, two things that you need to worry about ideally. But is this a C component question? No. No, no. I said there are two conditions, right? S could be an ancestral set in GS prime. Then also you are fine. Because of lemma 3. So building bigger in reverse sets using the two lemma. Smaller and smaller sets using two lemmas. I'm intervening more outside and I'm observing less inside. So that's very important. So I know, so S prime is a super set of S. Yes. I know interventional distribution on S prime. That means I've intervened on less number of variables. Yes, yes. But I want to estimate those where I've intervened on more number of variables, and I'm, I'm telling you when it's possible. When so S is clearly a subset of S prime. This this is But then, what, what, if S is a C component of S prime, or if S is an ancestral set in G S. But you will reapply it for now a superset of S prime and a superset of that. So actually, very worried if you start. Supersets and you keep reducing. I mean, okay, yeah, you can see it either way you want. It's just both ways. Is it clear? What, what? Okay. Sort of things. In the recursion of sorts, like the that we talked about. Yes, now I'll give you the final. It's two pages. It's very painful, but the only thing I want to and you to understand is just these two. That's all I'm trying to do. I'm just fishing for these two conditions. Literally, that's all that's good. Okay. So let's let's hide it. Yeah, yeah. So let's say in the sufficiency is you have already from the difficult part, I would imagine is. Uh, if you pay for the your yeah that I'm not going to show <laughs> that's very very hard it means a very really complicated conversation I like what the if you just assume that this is complete for some reason so, but for this one it's actually not that hard uh, but uh, yeah it's understanding it's the structure once the end yeah this is the key idea. Even the completeness part for this problem, it's actually not that, that hard. hard. Yeah, yeah, maybe you should then give one lecture here to figure out why that is the case. But this case. one is pretty simple. No, but the fact that whenever you don't end up in these two, you will necessarily reach that hedge. Yes, yes, yes. That needs some. I mean, once you realize that, it's very obvious, no doubt about that. But that's the thing that you need to do. Once you prove that, then you prove that all hedges actually have dual. And like two causal models that can give rise to the same observation data and so on. But the, the property of what is that where you will fail when you won't catch an international query, it will always land in a hedge. And that's, I think, is the key insight. I'm not going to prove that, is all I'm trying to say. Right? Okay, so now, fear. So I want to find you what? Compute PT of S. This is what I started with. <laughs> right? I just gave sufficient conditions. Now that we have a very powerful tool, Let's keep manipulating until we see when, when we can do anything now. Right. Okay, so let's start with P of B. P of B is actually equal to Q of B. Q of B notation I really like 
because if it's observation, there's nothing outside. It's called interventional with nothing intervening. <laughs> okay, so that uh, you always keep recursively going down. Now this is nothing but Q of S X times product of Q of S X. Very self-explanatory. These are C components of G. This is a C component that contains X. That's all. Sorry, T. Okay. Now, T here is a single variable. Uh, you can generalize this. This is a bit more complicated, so let me just do the single variable thing. Okay, so T is a But S is a subset. T is a single variable. Okay, so now uh, what is the interventional distribution? So, okay, I'm not looking at PD of S here, PD of everything. Okay, uh, which is just Q of V without T. Right? I intervened on T, Q of V event. Now, this is nothing but if Q of V factorizes like this, none of them contain T. They will all be the same. This guy ever is a factor involving T. But we slashed. So we will just simply say it is Q T without T. Same here that this is identical. Only notated, only notated it saying that the intervention that goes only in this C component, everything else just lives as it is. Right? So now this is just multiplied by Q of S. You are checking if this is uh, identifiable. These parts are identifiable, but this is not yet. Okay, it's anything important. By the way, P and children don't have to We have that this right in the previous, the first lab. Right? Now, uh, what we do is, let's say, so we know that if you care only about it, so I'm not, you don't care about B, you only care about this. So let's use the ancestor, the first ancestor, saying that only ancestors of its thing as matters. So now you basically consider ancestors of S, right? Uh, let's actually consider D to be an ancestor of S in G, B, because uh, you only care about this. You only so T can be forgotten. So that's an intervention. It's been intervened. So you only care about B bar T. I want to see what, what can what can happen. You know, these are all inter, these are all uh, only from this, this guy. So, yeah, now saying that okay, it's not identified in general, but now let me look at the ancestor. The frame is B minus T. B minus. Okay. So, Okay, so B minus P for that B prime equal to B prime. I hope you quickly use this B prime, but let's see. Okay, so D is an ancestor graph. Now, um, it's very clear. P, T of X is, if you have this, it's just marginalization. Okay. So you just marginalize with respect to all variables outside X, Q of B given. First, I only have everything except the put in an intervened part. Okay, now I only want intervention on, so now I only want uh, observations on this. So you just mark this without the rest of them. I'm still not saying this is identical. Only saying whatever I want is marginalized version of this guy. That's all I said. And this one factorizes like this, so these parts are also understood. Only this one remains. Okay, we will come to that. Is this here? There is nothing complicated. Okay, now what I'm going to do you must things, you do it using a color property. You first marginalize over B uh, then you is actually over V prime bar D. You can always do that. You can always split the marginalization however you like. So here what we do is this is just nothing but you first marginalize over everything except, see, S is never there. 
marginalized over D branches. Then you say the marginalized over D branch. By the way, this makes sense only because D is an ancestral set. D includes this, right? So exclude D, also excluded S. So I'm marginalizing all small variables. Then take the rest of the variables and marginalize over them. It's just like a tower property of that. And this is nothing but Q of V pi. Okay, now we are ready to apply. So now there's a very simple, nice observation. D is an ancestral set. D is an ancestral set in V prime with respect to uh, like uh, D itself essentially. So you can, if you if you marginalize over the rest of them, what do you get? You get the ancestral set. We said this. You get Q of W. Here we get Q of D. So ancestral lemma. To apply ancestral lemma, lemma three. Get D without S. Q of D. Again, I have not yet <laughs> said anything about the right say right? B given D needs to be estimated. Uh, but PD of this is all I care about. But that requires estimation only of D, not B given. Okay. That's a good part about this. So I only care about Q. All I've said is I, you just need to care about Q. And this is the difference, right? Because there is ancestor of S in G, B minus T. Correct. There we use only G. G. So this is very subtle. Okay, so you remove the the tree. The, the outcome there is you can about take the ancestral set. D, you say that okay, as long as I find the, the international effect on this D uh, of on everything else, then good. That's all you have said. I'm not claiming you can do this. You're saying that you are good if you can do this. Okay, but D itself is a graph. <laughs> okay, so you go and recurse. So, so you can do C component factorization. Why it's a bit convoluted. You can actually follow all the steps as I said, uh, but it's what it is. So now what I do, I, I don't know about some num something, right? Uh, some subset. So what do I do? I check one of those two conditions. So I first now check if it is a C component or not, uh, or I try to find the C components in it and try to see what I can do with it. But if you have this, you are good, basically. So now. You consider Q of D. We don't know this is an yet. Now uh, you take the original C ST and SI. You only care about this. So C components, as you know, has this uh, nice intersection. So you can consider D. If this was a C component uh, in ST, D intersection ST will be the C component that will remain. Right, because they throw out all other bidirectional. So in graph G D, the C components are, uh, let's say, uh, D. Right? So, so, so essentially, I'll denote this as D intersection S X, D intersection S I. These are the C components in G. Uh, call it D X. But these correspond to the original sequence. This one. Right? Now you can write Q of B as Q of B X multiplied by the product of Q of B I. Now, very interesting observation. Uh, B I is actually an ancestral set in G S I. Why is that? Because D itself is an ancestral set. Right? So now D I. Do you mind repeating this please? Yes. D I is an ancestral set in S I. Yes. Uh, D I is D intersection S I. But what is D? Right? Uh, I is essence, SI is the C component of the original graph. So, T is not contained. So it's a C component in V prime or V prime. So I G V prime. 
Only taking a C component within it, take the, inter the intersection of both, DI will also be an ancestral set in S. But DI need not be a C component. DI need not be a C component. DI is an ancestral set. Sorry, DI is an ancestral set. But DI is a C component in GD. It's very important. Okay. So, DI is an ancestral set plus a C component. Not really. No, plus a C component in D. I mean, I didn't mean the original graph. I only meant C component in GD. Okay, that's my definition. Why is it so? Uh, because uh, I am now uh, decomposing GD as some C components. Yeah, but D intersection SI is not a C component. Need not be a C component. Because SI was C component. SI was a C component of, uh, let's say, D prime for now. Now, if I actually take GD, which is a subset, and I come up with C components, uh, the bidirected edges, if there's a bigger component, and if I only consider some subset of nodes, it will be an intersection. So C components are nested. Okay. So this is also a C component. But in GD, I'm not claiming it's in it's in it's in G, it's only in GD. So the good part is C components actually let you transfer. Ancestral sets also let you transfer. So now you are actually going to exploit the power of this. So first I'm going to argue that Q of DI can all be ID from Q of SI. I don't want to bother writing the marginalization again and again. It's an ancestral set in SI, so Q of DI are all done. So all of this is done. Because Q of SI is observational distribution. This is this. So uh, when you take G and intersection SI, it, it is possible that like D, DI is actually two C components. Is that one first? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's saying that it could be DI1, DI2. Both are D intersection SI's party. But still they are individually identified. Yes, you are right. Yes, you are right. See, so you're saying that D is only ancestral in the respect of direct edges, but when you do D intersection SI, you are saying it's actually some sort of a C component generalization. Uh, split it. You split it into two. But the fact is that the whole thing is, see, I'm only using the fact that DI is an ancestral set in SI to conclude this. Okay. Then it's a union of C components in uh, GD that is true, essentially. That's all I'm trying. Why is DI, DI an ancestral set in SI? Because D is an ancestral set in GB. Oh, okay. <laughs> it has all its ancestors. You intersected because you wanted to restrict them. But with, the, with respect to the restriction, all the ancestral sets will be captured because otherwise uh, the, the original one will not be an ancestral set. Right? So because it's an ancestral set, not because it's a C component in SI, that this is actually Q of DI is ID from or Q of SI. So all these guys are done. Okay, if that's clear, right? So all these guys are basically done. Yeah, DI is an ancestral set of SI. That's the only thing that I have. Okay, actually, my claim was this is actually not correct. Uh, you are right that uh, I only need intersections of G B with respect to D inter uh, uh, with D intersection. SI. That's not the only thing that I actually can. Right. Okay. Now. Okay, now what we are going to do is uh, we have to worry about this Q of BX. So this is all taken care of, so we are fine. Q of BX is what we need to worry about. So here is where the recursion actually comes. Now you are interested in uh, an interventional distribution on Q of BX. Right? That's the original. So you started with Q of B prime, then you started with Q of D. Now you are in Q of DX getting smaller and smaller and smaller until it should be nothing. Then you are fine. Right. Uh, okay. Now let's see if uh, Q of BX is possible or not. Right. So what do I do with that? Okay. okay. So if I don't know, if I don't know, Particular component, uh, what is the magic I do? I again take C components. So that's what I'm going to do. Right? And I go intersect with SX and see what happens. 
That's all you're Okay, so dx is in Sx, right? St. dx is in Sp, but dt is in Sp. We know that. That's the only thing you know. Uh, and uh, q of d. So what you do is you don't know what q of d uh, t is. So what you, what you do is you actually try to make it into a sequence. So here what you do is you take g d of x. You have three components d x uh, i one d x two. Okay, I'm going to regret this up superscript d x one d x two and d x eight. So these are the super c components in g d x. Okay, so if Q of dx was then you could identify all of these guys. We want to understand when this can be computed directly from the, the, the mothership SK. That's what we want to actually find out. So if D X I is an ancestral set. In ST. Then life is good. Because I'll apply the lemma. There's one C component I know. Because it's the original. So this DT is inside ST. That's all I know. So again, composite will do some bunch of C components. One regression in each of those C components. Uh, I'm saying that if this guy is an ancestral set in ST, then life is simple because you. Uh, so this is clear. This is one condition. Now, the second condition is that uh, there's a chance that uh, one of the DXJs is actually equal to ST. Can happen uh, because I only said it's a subset. And I didn't say it's exactly equal. So it could actually happen. In which case, I don't know what to do. So I'll say it's failure. If uh, OK, so I have to be a bit careful here. Uh, DX is not an ancestral set. What I wanted to actually find out was ancestors of DXJ. Let's actually consider this set in SX. Okay, let's call this uh, GSX. Let's call this F. Okay, now if this ancestral set is equal, so if this ancestral set happens to be equal to dxi, which basically means I consider C components. I don't know if this is identifiable or not, so I cannot say if the C components are identifiable or not. But I have a mothership, but I have ancestral lemma holes. So I take all ancestral sets of, of, of these guys and check if the one of them happens to be ancestral. If any one of them happens to be ancestral, yes. So I have one this ancestral set B X I in SX could be actually equal to SX itself. Can just include everything because it could be the last node. Okay, it's all to do. What? what is K is equal to one? Because DX is equal to SX. No, no, it just simply means that all these are computed in the directors. So these are C components. So DXK comes at the sync node. And let's say everybody is connected to this in the directed way. Then there is nothing you can do about it. Uh, the ancestral graph of one of the C components is actually equal to the entire SX essentially. This case we can't handle. Do you fail? Okay, it's a fair. I mean, I don't have a condition for it. Right. Now, what is the the third condition we can have. Okay. 
This is a D X, which is not ancestral. Because if it was ancestral, essentially, but if it's not ancestral in SP, what would it? So for the third condition is your D X J is not ancestral. In ST, or DTJ is not ancestral in ST. It's actually G, DT, 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 also DT. Everything is successful to me. Sorry about that. So DT is not ancestral in ST. The only thing you know is DT is a C component. Uh, the original C component I expected with I put an estimate. That's why I came to this problem. Right? So then what you do is uh, you now assume that. So here you actually have to survey. So let's see. Not ancestral in this, but remember DTJ is actually contained in DT. So we know this, right? Okay. Now, your only hope is that this DTJ, careful about this lemma. You take G S T. We have never considered this graph so far so, so far. Now what you do is you take C components of this. B D is already in S T. Uh, fortunately, ancestral, so there's nothing we do about it. Uh, so you take the mothership G S T, which you just resolve it into C components. Yes. S T is a single C component. Single C component. So how uh, this is like no, this is in GST, right? I go into GST. Now we start breaking things up. No, but GST itself is a single C component. Yes, yes. So one single. So there is no partition. No partition. Yeah, correct. Yes, partition. One partition. But now I'm going to assume. Uh, so the C is actually contained in a C component uh, T prime. So now you agree that uh, T J is contained in uh, one C component. You know that this is true. Okay. So then what you actually do is uh, you try to identify uh, this subset, DDJ, uh, and you give this C component, ST. And uh, you have to give some query essentially to this basic guy, right? But Q of ST is identified, which means I can marginalize with respect to anything I want, essentially. So then what you do is this DTJ is actually contained in one C component, which is some major C component essentially. So what you actually do is you actually supply Q of ST. Because this is identifiable. You can even supply any subset actually. All the subsets of this are identifiable uh, in the sense that the marginalized versions are actually identifiable. So you actually you actually supply all these subsets and you ask your question. Okay, this is my graph. This is the query I know. You go over again until you hit somewhere and you never hit failures. Okay. So it's a bit complicated. I completely agree, but that's what it is. Uh, so all that has happened, just recap, is that I started from P minus T, uh, and I wanted to only know about the interventional effect on only S, right? Then I only took the ancestral graph of S, which is actually given by D, uh, and I considered the C components of uh, the D graph. Now those C components, if they happen to be ancestral, you are lucky. You can actually just uh, directly marginalize with respect to ST. Now, suppose if one of the ancestral components is equal to ST, I don't know what actually to do. 
because we only want Q of DT, not ancestral version of DT. So we don't want this. But if DT is not an ancestral set in ST, uh, but uh, DTJ is actually a subset of DT, then what you do is you again go to the mothership. That's the only thing you know, because GST is a C component. Now you say that DT of J is one C component. Other things don't matter. So this can be identified. So you give that as an observational data. This is the set of nodes that you care about. And the query that you that was not ancestral, you just pass it here and just say, and then you request. So these three parameters, the last one is the distribution. Ah. What are the first two? Uh, this is a subset. This is the total number of variables. Uh, subset uh, that we want. Subset we want is uh, C, P, Q, Q, D, D, J in G, S, D. But this is not really atoms, right? We were looking at the algorithm. What is the term? Like singleton. So here it is not, a, this is not a singleton. This is not a singleton, but this is an interventional distribution on everything of, of interventional effect of everything on DTJ. In fact, if you look at it, it's always writing it in that form. And you work with queues, you are, it's true that you only eventually wanted the singleton, but you did a lot of stretching, but I eventually needed Q of DT prime. Uh, but so Q of DTI, if they are ancestral, I took care of it. If they are such cells, we don't know what to do. So what I do is I take this one C component for which you need data distribution. So you just take off everything else. You only focus on that inside, and then you basically pass this. Yes. What were the arguments to ID also? What were the original arguments to this algorithm? ID? Like what was instead of DT? Oh, okay. So what your arguments for ID was unfortunately. Uh, you want to actually ID B minus D, right? Uh, then you want to give uh, V, and then you want to give P of V. This is how we initialize it. And from that, it became this unfortunate. Basically, you go to the component where T is found. You find out all the factors which you can find using the ancestral thing. There will be a factor which you cannot still find. So you basically ask that question, okay, can I intervene on that? Is that clear? And when D is not a singleton, the algorithm is almost exactly the same. Correct. Uh, but there's a simple marginal, I mean, there's a simple connection between the joint distribution and this. Uh, which I didn't mention, but yes, it's a very simple two, three steps. I think it's actually exactly right. There's nothing wrong. See, uh, all that matters is B minus T. Uh, if T was a singleton, I had all. The reason is, if T was not a singleton, there won't be one C component with ST. I have to now keep track of multiple C components and all that. That's the only reason why it did not uh, go through with that. But, but each uh, one of them will go through the same process. We'll go through the same process. The only difference is that, that instead of P of ST, it will be product of product of T of ST. But that's a complication which I didn't want to get. So you keep going through ancestral lemma, and if you actually have C components, you are lucky. So C components transfer, ancestors transfer. That's all there is. That is that. You just keep recursing it until you fit a ball like this, where you include the entire uh, C component ancestral set. So D T cannot be identified. This statement exactly translates to the next statement. If there is one C component, and if there's a subset, and the ancestor of that subset is exactly equal to the C component, it turns out it's a H. And whenever hedges are going to run, that's a very powerful claim to prove. No, but going from this to that step, there is only this second uh, second step. Second step is the only thing that happens. Yes, right. True. I don't deny that. Okay, so summary. The ID algorithm might be complicated. You can even see the, the, the paper. But there are essentially three ideas. Point is that there's a graph theoretic structure which if you run into, you should so yeah. start thinking about that. Yes. So if Q of C is known, if W is ancestral in GC, Q of W. 
The second thing is, uh, if Q of C is known, all its C components are known. All its Q of C I, uh, C I is a C component are known. The third thing, uh, Q is the interventional distribution where you intervene on everything else and then you observe C. I mean, that's what's always been the Q. Yeah, but there's no PC means. There is no PC means. It's some interest. Yeah, some partition interest for this. You can call it whatever you want. The three is the more important thing that points towards having the set that if you have C to be a C component, but W, uh, the ancestral set of in GC is equal to C, right? C, C is a single C component. And in GC, the ancestral set of W is equal to C. There's a problem. Uh, you fail. You ever hit this, you fail. Uh, if you hit this, you get what is called a hedge. And W is also a C component. It might be an implication. Uh, w in itself is a C component because. Uh, is that DTJ is a C component. Okay, so a single C component W is also a C component with respect to C. Respect to W's. Uh, no, but in GC, right? That's what is important. But GC, C is a single C component in the original graph. C is also a C component in GC. C is a single C component in GC. But that means yeah, yeah, because but that need not be the case. No, C was a C. G of C is C component. G sub C is a C component. Oh, because everything is connected, so it has to be a C component. So W G W is a C component. That's it. Okay, G W is a C component. You are saying I don't know whether this condition is actually necessary. I'm just trying to figure out where I use this. Uh, because you're saying DTJ is a C component in DT. But uh, DTJ is a C component in DTG. That's all we need. We need that. That's all I'm saying. So GW is a C component. W is a C component in GW. But GW is a C component. That's all I'm saying. GW, I mean, if, if you take uh, oh, only restricted to GW, you're saying that has to be connected within itself and that can't be cut. Correct. Okay. GW and GC, both are C. And W is a subset of C. Okay, and then if you have the ancestor set covering the entire C, then it's a hedge. And if you get a hedge, you cannot identify. And that proof, uh, I'm not going to. Hedge is a structure. Which are combinatorial to structure. Okay, so <laughs> in order to define hedge, I have to first define uh, you what a tree, rooted tree is. And uh, a rooted tree, which is a C component, is also a hedge. But there's a generalization of this notion that that happens. So basically, you have a tree uh, in the directed graph, but it's a whole. The whole thing is itself a C component. If you ever have that structure, this will happen. But there is this orientation also that you have to keep track of because this is saying ancestor uh, ancestors of W fully is contained in GC. So what you do is you define a tree. So the entire tree uh, is basically uh, ancestral, and it's also a C component. Then you will end up satisfying this criterion in some particular way. Uh, then you have to worry about uh, that particular tree and all. So if you take the root of the tree, root meaning uh, the other way, right? If you take the child of the tree, everything is and it's rooted in the sense that everything is basically ancestral to this particular node. If I take that to be W, essentially this whole thing is a C component. This is also a C component by definition. But the ancestral set of this is actually itself a C component. Then it turns out that GW cannot be estimated. Q of W cannot be estimated. Interventional effect of other things on W actually cannot be estimated. If that node hides in a place, the ancestor of which itself is a C component, there is nothing to it. You cannot shrink it anymore because it is totally confirmed. That's all it means. Uh, but beyond that, is there any other interpretation? I don't know. So the simplest example is, of course, the simplest example is the y, this thing. 
it's a tree rooted in y you always care about the interventional effect of everything else on y I mean, here there are only two things uh, and it's also a c component right and y is also a c component by triviality therefore this is a hedge but this is not the uh, the most complicated version of edge you can actually have uh, for example now if I this is an identifiable. I don't think it is identifiable. Uh, I think this is also a hedge because you want the interventional effect. Of, but here you have to be very careful. You usually want interventional effect of P on Y, but here actually P comes. So it's a bit tricky. Uh, we are talking about some other international distribution, not the international distribution that you want. You have to reduce that to particularly some particular case over here. But if you want international effect of this set on Y, within a C component, you can. T on Y is probably trivial, but T comma M on Y is not trivial. So these kinds of structures are called rooted trees, which themselves are C components. They are definitely hedges, but that's not the only definition of hedge. There's a more general definition that becomes a hedge actually, and that's like a uh, problem. Yeah, but the only thing that matters is these three. <laughs> okay, how can you transfer if it's a C component or with an ancestral set? But if uh, this condition happens, then you're screwed. I'll end it here. I know it's a bit complicated at the end. I said that it would be complicated. Yeah, please. It's just more pedagogy. Yeah. I have no idea why you have to do two layers. I don't know why there's not a simpler thing with only one layer. Uh, but uh, I have searched carefully enough. It seems like this is the simplest way in which you can connect to all the things I discovered. Uh, I, I basically said before. There is one more point that yeah. we need to emphasize. Like, there has to be positive results. Yeah, otherwise, yeah. otherwise uh, nothing works. No, but the example um, is a non positive one, usually they give, right? But they care too much about the positive solution. No, without positivity, this entire theory doesn't make sense, right? Because you are conditioning. Ah, okay. I see. Marginalizing and so no, but all, he... all these conditions that become only. Yeah. Yeah. There are so many marginalizations. Yeah, meeting it, right? But I don't know how to. I thought Rahul will take care. So, you are But, I mean, 